Very special roundtable tonight, too, because I have very two very distinguished people in the world of popular music. Michael Jackson, welcome for the first time to the roundtable. How are you? I'm doing good. I saw you, of course, on Top of the Pops last night. I was with you on Top of the Pops <laughs> last night. You're in the midst of a, a big world tour now, right? That's true. We're uh, doing a lot of different dates in Switzerland and Paris. How far into the tour are you? We just started, actually. We're two weeks into it. And you're all geared up. You've got to pace yourself or something like that, I would imagine. Yes, we've been so busy. We had rehearsal today. day. I'm going to find out <laughs> about some of the things that you've been doing. I'm glad you were able to make it along to the program. And in terms of, of global popularity, I suppose the Jacksons are only eclipsed by my next guest's old band, George Harrison. Welcome. Good evening, kid. Hi. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. And you have had a busy time, too, because you've just flown in from... A Rio. Rio by the sea. Oh. <laughs> the only stock in Rio. Oh, Rio. <laughs> Were you doing anything musical down in Rio, or was it... A, uh, I, I sort of used uh, the excuse of going to see the Brazilian Grand Prix to have a look at Brazil, or a part of Brazil, because I've never been to South America before. In fact, none of the Fab Four have ever been there, which I found out when I arrived, because it was a bit of uh, mania down there. But it's a wonderful place. I'd love to go there, a country I, I, one day I will go there. Well, you're both in the program. There's so much to talk about, and we'll do that, and also play as many of the new releases as we can between now and 8 o'clock. It's the round table, and our first record up tonight is from Foreigner, who enjoyed great success in America. In fact, uh, this current record's number 20 in the charts over there. It's called Blue Morning, Blue Day. That's Foreigner, and that's uh, a new single release over here for them on blue vinyl, not just on blue vinyl, but it's sort of a picture disc as well. And Michael Jackson, I'll go to you first and ask your reaction to that. I like the guitars on that. It's uh, very strong in the beginning. I love the guitars on the, uh, the one you played of him. On, uh, George's, yeah. Yeah, well, the, on Dark Records. I like that a lot. Really. I mean, I think it gets your attention in the beginning. Right. I, actually, it's strange that Michael should talk about guitar work in that because the guitarist is Mick Jones, who was a guitarist in a band I saw you with in New York television a few years ago called Wonder Wheel. Gary right. Wright, Wonder Wheel. That's right. Jones. In fact, Mick Jones, um, I'm pleased for him that this band is a success because we first met him in 64 in Paris in the Olympia, and he was the musical director for Sylvie Vartan and uh, what's his name Johnny Johnny Halliday Johnny, Johnny Halliday <laughs> and uh, at that time Mick was like the conductor in the band and playing guitar and he was with Gary Wright also in um, Apart from Wonder Wheel in Spooky Tooth so I thought the record was was very <laughs> pleasant <laughs> and he is a great guitar player yeah I like that the thing about Wonder Wheel was uh, it was a band and, and I'd, I've never seen any of uh, your, you or your, your former uh, pals talk about or you're still friends of yours presumably the Beatles uh, yeah. talk about other bands but seeing you on television in New York uh, with Wonder Wheel you obviously were very keen on them whatever became of them well actually uh, Wonder Wheel uh, was a sort of in between Spooky Tooth Spooky Tooth splitting up and then getting back together again so Gary Wright formed Wonder Wheel and then part of that band, uh, well, they split Wonder Wheel and then they got back the singer from Spooky Tooth uh, with Mick Jones and Gary Wright and I uh, forget the drummer's name, but they reformed Spooky Tooth uh, for a couple of records and then Gary Wright went his own way, made a solo album, which, you know, uh, Dreamweaver. That's right, and he's appeared on record with yeah. you, of and Mick Jones, uh, I don't know what happened to him up until they made the first Foreigner album, which is, was a huge success. In America. Strangely enough, they, they've never really happened here, but I think that is the record to do it for them. This is Nicolette Larson, and this is a new single on Warner Brothers. It's a Neil Young song called Lot of Love. In America, that's number 10. It's just been released over here on Warner Brothers Records and Lot of Love. And George Harrison, you expressed interest in that record before the program. Yeah, I think she's very nice. She looks nice, too. She sings good, <laughs> and the, the production's really good. Ted Templeman, one of Warner Brothers' um, producers. Oh, interesting to know who played the sax on here. Sounds a bit like Tommy Scott. <clears throat> but um, I think if Stan and Reg, the Warner Brothers, promote that, should be a big hit. <laughs> <laughs> Were you familiar with that song before, or just Nicolette Larson? Just Nicolette Larson, yeah. Actually, my missus did play it to me this afternoon, coincidence. Uh -huh. So she likes it, too. She's a, a session singer, not your missus, but Nicolette Larson. Oh, yeah. I never met her before. I never really heard much about her until this album. <clears throat> What about you, Michael? I like it a lot. I've heard it lots of times. And I it, guess so, yeah. Of right. course. And I think it has a beautiful melody, especially the punchline. That thing. Thank you. 
nice. Very familiar tune. Mm. Melody is, is, is obviously, uh, these days, a very important very. part of, of your your music. I've noticed that the last couple of things have been released have, have had a very strong melody line that it was not maybe so obvious in the earlier records that, that, that you released. Uh, that's true for the singles, but... Um for the other stuff, I mean, it's different. I mean, I think melodies are always important. I mean, especially like some of the the old Beatle things. I mean, I think the melodies are beautiful. I mean, that's that's what I think make them stay around so long. Yeah, that's why I like melodies too. Really, I mean, the thing that put me off a lot of pop music is the way it's uh, you know you can't distinguish what the tune is supposed right. to be. Actually, I disagree. I think the Jacksons had a lot of melodies. Remember the first big hit that I ever heard about was. No, uh, what was that one? We had a fantastic bass line. Uh, I'll remember the, the love title. you save, ABC. Later. Um, Something like that. No, I, I forgot it anyway. But yeah, it that's sounded really a bit like melodies. I mean, if you just hum, uh, here comes the sun, or fool on the hill. I mean, the melody is so pretty. You don't. I mean, the lyrics are beautiful too, but. I mean, you don't well, really those need are it. both both songs of yours, are they not? Not fool on the hill. No, that was um, a Paul's song. The other one that was mine. And you were mentioning that from an, an album that's coming out soon, the Blow Away single is taken from a new album called George Harrison. You've got a song on it, uh, oh, yeah. a cousin to uh, Here Comes the yeah. Sun. Yeah, Here Comes the Moon. I thought, um, <laughs> I mean, it was the circumstance. I was in a particularly great place when I saw the moon coming up. And I thought, wow, you know, all this and Here Comes the Moon. And then I thought, no, I couldn't write a song called that. They'll kill me. But... As it happened, I wrote the song, and um, it turned out really nice, so it stands up in its own right. And any other songwriters around, they have had ten years to write Here Comes the Moon after Here Comes the Sun. So <laughs> nobody else wrote it, I might as well do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> is it a pretty song like Here Comes the yeah, Sun? Yeah, it, it is. It's, in fact, it, it, it's a very sort of peaceful song. And the problem with uh, mixing it was I kept falling asleep. By the time it gets to the end, it's put me into the dream world. Well, it's obviously a track that we look forward to hearing from this new album, which should be out uh, soon. Soon, I, I don't re recall which day. 23rd, I think, for my birthday. I want to talk about your, your forthcoming album, if I can now, George, because it's been a while since you've recorded an album. 1976 was the last time an album was released here, and that was 33 and a third. And so I should ask you what you've been doing in the intervening period, uh, first in musical terms. Yeah, well, in music terms, I sort of skived for 1977. I went on strike. <laughs> like, uh, uh, I just went to the races, actually. and um, Car races? Yeah, to the motor racing. And uh, I was just really getting a bit fed up with uh, the music business, to tell you the truth. I mean, it has been a long time being in it. And... Uh, you know, I just felt like a break, so I took 1977 away from music, and I didn't actually write a tune during that year. I just sort of forgot all about music, went to the races, and then at the end of 77, I thought, God, I better start doing something, you know. I heard all these stories about um, people drying up, you know, so I thought, well, maybe I'll write a tune, see if I can just write a tune, and I wrote Blow Away. It was a miserable day, pouring with rain, and um, we are having a few leaks in the roof of the house and all that sort of stuff. Where about was this? At home here, in England. Oh, uh, England is, yeah. is your home? I live here, yeah. I live here all the time. People seem to think I live in America, yeah. but I, yeah. I live here. <laughs> and so I, I wrote that song, <clears throat> and I was, to tell you the truth, I was a bit embarrassed by it. It was so, it seemed like it was so catchy, and it, it seemed like uh, I was a bit embarrassed to play it to anybody. You know, I thought, God, it's, it's a bit too obvious. Well, and, uh, it's funny because I, I remember reading that uh, when uh, John and Paul were writing songs for the Beatles and that, all that output, it was a while before you worked up sort of courage to present your songs to, in, in, in that well, concept. Was that for the same reason? No, no, they wrote... They wrote uh, right from during school, you know, when we were at school, they wrote a load of, of tunes, which, you know, were not really that good. Well, a couple of them, I think one of them we recorded on the Let It Be album, One After Nine or yeah. Nine. And yeah. That one they wrote, uh, you know, when we must have been about 15 years old, 16. So they had a, a bit of a head start, but because they did write such good tunes and the Beatles took off, well, it was made it more difficult for me as a songwriter because... You know, the starting point had to be a bit, uh, you know, I mean, it's if there's already so many good tunes, then I have to try and write better. <coughs> so um, I think the first tune I wrote was 1963 uh, as an experiment. 
to see if I could write a tune. It was called Don't Bother Me. It's a grumpy song. <laughs> it was actually it was all right for the first tune, but but then it was really a matter of practice. The more you do, the more easy it becomes, you know. Two weeks ago, he was in a studio with Charlie Gillett talking about other folks' records, and I know he listens to the program. Dave Edmonds, oh, good evening. That's a one on the jukebox, which is taken from the album <coughs> Tracks on Wax 4. And uh, like Nick Lowe, who produces Dave Edmonds' songs, his songs have uh, some sort of familiarity about them. This reminds me of other things somehow. Yeah, I agree. I like Dave Edmonds, uh, but that song reminds me straight off... I've never heard it before, but it's, uh, I want you to tell me how you walk down on me. You know, the Everly Brothers walk right back, um, speed it up a bit, except for the bridge, different bridge. But it's a um, <laughs> pretty pleasant record, though, all the same. It's nice. Rock and roll, I would imagine, played an important part in your, in your early days. Yeah. Who were you, did so. you have any heroes that are still with you today? Yeah, I, I must admit that, the, the stuff I liked back in the late 50s, early 60s is still the, the, the music I like the most now. You know, Eddie Cochran, Buddy Holly, Little Richard, Larry Williams, uh, you know, those sort of things. Timeless. Yeah. What about you, Michael Jackson? How uh, far as the record or? Rock and roll, generally speaking. Um, it's about the same people he said, Chuck Berry and... Uh... But he howling a little Richard and all those guys. You recorded a song, Rocking Robin, but nothing, you've never really gone into a rock, recorded a rock and roll number as such, have you? Um, yeah. On our new album, Destiny, there's one that's, I mean, it's kind of disco -y, but rock and roll. It kicks off. It's called All Night Dancing. The new album, you're kind of pleased with, I would imagine, because you've actually produced and, and wrote all the songs on the album. There's one song that... Um, you didn't uh, have a 100% hand in, in, in recording, but most of the album you had, this was the first yes. time for you, wasn't it? Right. Why, why this album and, and not before? What, what? Because uh, it's kind of difficult to get people b to believe in you, to, you know, you have to tell them, I, you know, I want to do it for once, and, and some people believe in you, some don't, and finally they give you the chance, and they see what you can do, and then they let you do it. So you're confident in, in just going on from here, I suppose, and doing mm -hmm. your own stuff. Did, did, let me ask you a question. Did you guys always write your own stuff, I mean, from the beginning? Yeah, well, John and Paul wrote right from before we um, ever made How did you ever records. manage that? I don't know. They were clever little fellas. <laughs> <laughs> but we did record, um, you know, the first two albums we recorded, about half of uh, the albums were other people's songs. Like, we, we did a lot of cover versions of... Like we did Twist and Shout, the, oh, yeah. the Isley Brothers. Matchbox. Yeah. Matchbox. We did all kinds of, you know, and, a, and some more obscure tunes. Well, we did Money, too, like the... Did you miss Lizzie? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. We did a lot of uh, other people's songs in the early mm. days. That's right. But it all, it's amazing. I mean, the, the, the way that your careers have, have, have gone and you've... Uh, and you've sort of lasted, both of you, through so many, many years. And, uh, Michael, you particularly um, sort of overcame the initial kind of teenage hysteria and have really established yourself in, in other areas where you do sort of cabaret rooms and you fill concert halls and things like that, you know, where people will listen and not just scream all the time, you know. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I'm thankful that uh, there's so many different things that I want to do and I'm uh, being able to do it, which is important. Good. Dave Edmonds, I like the record A1 on the jukebox, by the way. We've almost forgot about that. <laughs> what about you, Marcel? Uh I like the story. I do. It seems like, oh, um, rock and roll, kind of. I mean, it reminded me of an old tune when it first kicked off, the, the style of the music. I like the story, though. But why did he end it with, I'm nowhere? I noticed. No, he was saying he's A1 on the jukebox, but it's not. it's nowhere on the charts. Which is a good story. It sounds like a, it's like a nowhere on the charts. I think he said. Yeah, yeah, that's it's right. It's like a sort of country western type idea. Yeah. You know, that sort of. There is a certain amount of truth in that, of course, whereby the jukebox in America they have their own charts because jukeboxes. Uh -huh. You know, you you see songs in jukeboxes for years and years. The same songs. Keep yeah, it's there. a good idea for the for a lyric. You know, sometimes to write a song is uh, if you get a good idea, then you're often running. You can't. You know, you can sit there for hours and it's the initial idea, so that, as a song, is a good idea. Anyone who's had the pleasure... Motown, that was Diana Ross, Marvin Gaye, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder. What a lineup! Pops, we love you. Almost mm. as good as the lineup in tonight's round table. George Harrison and Michael Jackson. I mean, Michael, obviously you know a lot about Motown records. Would they have all been in the studio together recording that song? Um, I don't think so. 
now. Well, you arrived on the scene, Michael, in through Motown Records, and that's where you found sort of success around the world. And then you you left Motown Records, and you're now on Epic Records here. What, <clears throat> what, t- tell me about the days w- w- with Motown. Uh, did you have are they affectionate days that you remember Motown Records by? Well, the early days of Motown are really, I mean, they're kind of like classical days. Yeah. I mean, we were so young at the time. I remember everything. We first, we first performed for Barry Gordy and his, and, and uh, they loved our performance. And Diana came over special, made a special uh, thanks, and she congratulated us and told us she wanted to be a special part of our career. And of course she was. What songs were you doing? I mean, that, that interests me. Were you doing some old Motown hits, or did you have original things you were? We were recording? doing some James Brown stuff, some old Motown hits. We were doing It's Your Thing by the Isley Brothers. Oh, yes. How old would you have been then? Around seven. <laughs> seven? Yeah. Gee. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. I, I mean, you know. <laughs> you, the thing is that, that it's Motown, you think of, of, as you say, the family thing, and that's, uh, you know, the, all the artists knew each other really, really well. Was, was that the case then? That's very true. But what happened? Because things obviously were not <clears throat> so good, otherwise you, you would have left, presumably. You wouldn't have left. <laughs> right. Uh, there were a couple of things, and I mean, I hate deals and contracts and all that stuff. I think most artists do. But um, like I said before, we always wanted to write our own material and have our own publishing company and production company, different things like that, and we finally got a chance to do it. Uh, we never got that chance on Motown to write our own songs, which we always wanted to do. There's maybe a parallel with with Apple, I suppose. That was a very uh, family type thing, wasn't it? With the, with everybody, I mean, we get the impression that it was yeah. in the early days. Well, but the thing is, we always um, we always had the freedom to do what we wanted, and uh, the, that's I think the main difference. That Tamla Motown, you know, up until like Stevie Wonder really turned it around, because up until then he was, you know, everybody was expected to do the. The, the same sort of tunes, and uh, it was all the same production. It was like an assembly line yeah. in Detroit. It was like the motor cars in a way, and they made really good records. But for the artist who wanted to, you know, be very individual, I think yeah, I could imagine it'd be quite hard. For us, it, it was more of a thing to, um, you know, Apple was just really our own identity sort of thing away from, although we were still with EMI, we wanted to have some other <coughs> artists on the label. Although we were at the EMI up until 75, I think. It was like the Foreign Legion. But I think if um, we'd have had a contract that was shorter, we would have left EMI much sooner. Just, you know, just in order to... um, Because we signed with them when we were very young, not seven years old. I mean, we were about four years old. (laughs) We signed with them until we were about 43. (laughs) The Apple days, though, I mean, you, as you said, you, you just brought in talent to expose through your own label. I mean, I associate Mary Hopkins very much with Paul McCartney. I associate actually Hot Chocolate with John Lennon, because I remember that <laughs> right, single, yeah. Give Me a Chance. Yeah. Who, who do you, which of the artists were, Jackie Lomax? Well, I pro- yeah, I produced Jackie Lomax record, and I did Billy Preston, Doris Troy. And, oh, Doris uh, Troy. Yeah, yeah, and I did... Um, I did a, a sort of one-off record with the Krishnas, you know, the Krishna yeah, Temple. Yeah, yeah. Actually, got in the top top of the pops. I got him on top of the pops. It was great. All that with the Govinda. Heads. Well, that was the second one. They did the Hare Krishna mantra. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I think uh, with Jackie Lomax was uh, he was from the old Liverpool days in a band called the Undertakers, and there was a lot of other friends of ours who were always saying, "Go on, why don't you, you know, record Jackie, give him a break." But, uh, and you did. What, what, what happened to Apple? I mean, is it, is a, it is a simple story, to, <clears throat> sort of a fable it's, somewhere? It's the most complicated story ever, you know. It's still there. Apple is more or less just a company that, um, you know, employs lawyers <laughs> yeah. still. I mean, it's like, it's, I don't know, it, we've been trying to dissolve the, the thing for years, but um, you know, it's very difficult. It's very complicated. It's like um, war and peace. <laughs> okay, we won't get into that, but into some more music. Manfred Man's Earth Band and a Bob Dylan song called You Angel You, which is out on the bronze label as their new single. Manfred Man's Earth Band, and that was, as I said, a Bob Dylan song called You Angel You. Well, of course, Manfred Man has chosen other Bob Dylan songs and Bruce Springsteen songs before and successfully taken them into the chart. Michael, 
did that appeal to you at all, that uh, treatment of that song? I don't know if you're familiar with the original version, but... Could what you about ask George first while I think about it, please? <laughs> George, yeah, well, you, you as yeah. a friend of Bob Dylan's, why well, would you react to that? Yeah, I'd prefer Bob's version, to tell you the truth. But, um, I mean, that is, that's like a really strong uh, <clears throat> record, you know. I, to tell you the truth, I've no idea what, what's a hit and what isn't a hit these days. But um, <laughs> but that's you know that was quite pleasant. But uh, as I say, I prefer Bob Dylan's version. Nothing personal, Manfred. Okay, uh, Michael. Uh, I I could never fall asleep on it because it was so you know up and out. Um, God, I don't know what to say. Okay. Well, what is the name of it again? You Angel, you. In the group. Manfred Mann's Earth Band. I never heard it in before. Oh, oh, it would be interesting to get Bob Dylan's reaction on this. Actually, mm -hmm. I wonder, are you, would he be aware or, 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 or would you be aware in the same kind of category of, uh, of celebrityhood, I suppose, of other people recording your songs and taking them into the charts? Do you? Oh, yeah, I'm sure once it, if it gets a lot of radio play and, uh, you know, and it does anything in sales, I'm sure he'll know about it. I mean, that, that's really nice as a songwriter if somebody else does the songs. Even bad versions, you know, it's nice, just the idea. But Bob is probably not impressed because it takes a lot to impress Bob Dylan. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, everybody's recorded his tunes. And... Yeah. What, what about your, your, your songs? Is there anybody that's recorded any one of your songs that you are particularly happy with the way they did? Uh, yeah. One in particular, well, there's, a, there's quite a few. I mean, I liked, uh, I've been a big fan for years of Smokey Robinson. He did um, something. Actually, when I was writing that song, I, in my mind, I was thinking of Ray Charles singing it. As it happened, the song ended up with over 150 cover versions, but when Ray Charles did it, I was really disappointed, except for the middle. The bridge to it, he sings great, but it was a bit of a corny sort of way he did it. But the one that really made up for all of that was James Brown. I did it really. James that Brown did it in 1972. He redid <laughs> Think as a single, and on the B side, he did something which was, it's fantastic. I've got it on my jukebox at home, and it's, I mean, it's just unbelievable, you know, the way he sings it. And the arrangement is, is really beautiful. Michael. You were going to say something. I never, you wrote something? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I was surprised. That's another one of my favorite ones. I thought uh, Lennon and McCartney did that. Everybody thinks so. They do, don't they? I didn't know you wrote that one. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's 24 minutes before 8 o'clock, and here is an exciting sound that Paul Gambaccini has been playing on his American chart show on Saturday afternoons, mainly because the Blues Brothers album is number one in America. This single I'm about to play from the album is number 16 in the charts, and this is their version of a Sam and Dave song from many years ago, Soul Man. Yeah. Blues Brothers, and a single from America's number one album called Soul Man. Actually, the Blues Brothers have other identities, and George, maybe you can tell us a bit about them, because you're quite friendly, are you not, with them? Yeah, um, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, uh, they do, well, they've been for years on a show called Saturday Night Live, and also, John Belushi is uh, Ron Decline, who was the Ruttles manager, <laughs> and Brian Sy, Dan Aykroyd, was the one who turned down the Ruttles. So I was surprised, although Belushi's always um, been quite famous for his impersonations of Joe Cocker. Yeah. Uh, so he's obviously is, um, you know, a potential serious singer too. So I thought the album was going to be maybe a comedy album, but obviously with uh, Duck Dunn and Steve Cropper and Tommy Scott and all those people playing on it, uh, it's good, very good. Talking about comedy, I must ask you about your involvement in the forthcoming Monty Python film, which is... Brian of, of Nazareth? Well, yeah, I think it's called uh, um, Monty Python's Life of Brian, although some people think maybe it should be called Brian of Nazareth, but it could be called Monty Python's Life of Brian of Nazareth. Um, well, I got involved with it because, um, well, actually, it's probably, say, on the beginning of the film, um, Bernard Delfont doesn't proudly present Monty Python's Life of Brian. I mean, I got involved with it when they backed out of the film. EMI. Because really, I'm just a Monty Python fan. I wanted to go and see it at the, the movies. So um, somebody suggested to me maybe I could figure out a way of raising the money for them to make it. That's all, really. But it's very funny, and it should be at your local cinema during the summer. Sure. Could you tell us a little about the plot? Is there? Yeah, well, it's really... 
it's a, it's nothing to do with Christ, really. It's what it is is um, a guy called Brian who gets born at the same time as Christ in the manger just across the road, and it really just follows his life. And he's, you know, he's a bit of an idiot, really. Okay. That's uh, Monty Python. Uh, it's how, yeah, how everybody sort Brian. of was into um, Messiah mania. You know, they mistake all kinds of things as signs and start following Brian around thinking he's the Messiah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I look forward to that in the summer. George, you, you mentioned that very often cover versions are not as good as the original versions. You were involved very much, obviously, with the original version of this song. Yeah. How does Lenny White's version grab you? I like it a lot. I think it's fantastic. It's still not as good as the original version, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still prefer the Fab Falls version, but it is great. I like that a lot. Michael, what about uh, your reaction to that record? I think it's very good. The way they updated it and made it sound good for today's sound. Thanks very much. Michael Jackson and George Harrison on tonight's Roundtable. As you know,